right. How is everybody? You guys, good morning. Good morning. I am thrilled, beyond thrilled. You guys excited yes. to be here? Was it a good movie? Yes. Oh, wonderful. I, I am so glad you all are here to help us celebrate Black History Month at the White House. We're doing a bunch of stuff this month, but this is one of the highlights. And we are uh, thrilled to, to be here with you all. I want to start by thanking Rachel Goslins uh, for agreeing to moderate the workshop today. Rachel is a member of the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanity, Humanities. And uh, what that means is that her job is to connect all Americans, uh, especially young people, uh, to music, art, dance, and film. So thank you, Rachel, as always. Thanks for all your hard work. And uh, yeah, yay for Rachel. <laughs> and of course, I also want to thank our, our guests who are with us today, Ben Zeitlin, Dwight Henry, and Quivangene, my girl. Did I say that right? Did I get that right? Quivangene. Quivangene. Quivangene Wallace for being here today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> but it's a special joy um, to have so many bright, smart, and talented young people here. You guys are looking good. And I know that some of you have traveled all the way from New Orleans, is that correct? And many of you are here right from DC, right in our neighborhood, our neighbors, right? But let me tell you, no matter where you come from or how far you traveled, um, we're just glad you're here today to watch what I consider to be one of the most powerful and important movies uh, that has been put out this year or in a long time, quite frankly, uh, Beast of the Southern Wild. And as I was telling the, uh, the cast and the directors and the producers in the other room, uh, I had the opportunity to watch this movie this summer with a large group of our friends and family. Uh, and the ages ranged from three to 75 years old. Uh, we got a big family. Uh, but it's rare these days to find a movie that can so completely and utterly captivate such a broad audience. And that was one of the things that struck me about this movie. Uh, it, it managed to be beautiful, joyful, uh, and devastatingly honest. Um, it's a movie that makes us all think deeply about the people we love in our lives who make us who we are. Uh, it shows us the strength of our communities, no matter what they look like. Uh, it shows us that those communities can give us the power to overcome any kind of obstacles. And it also tells a compelling story of poverty and, and devastation, but also uh, of hope and, and love in the midst of some great challenges. Um, so there are, are so many important lessons to learn in that little 93 minutes. That's, another, that's the other cool thing, that a director and a set of writers and producers can say so much in just 93 minutes. Uh, and it doesn't always happen in a movie, quite frankly. <laughs> but this one did it. And that's why I love this movie so much and why uh, our team wanted to bring it here to the White House and share it with all of you. Uh, I am honored and grateful that the creators and actors of the movie have taken time to join us uh, here today, particularly given their extremely busy schedules. I mean, this is the high time, this is high season for film, right? Uh, ben, Dwight, and Quivinjane, did I get that right? <laughs> Do you have a nickname? Yeah. A few. Okay. None you're willing to share with me? Q. Q. Can I call you Q? Sure. Okay. <laughs> They've been traveling all across the country m promoting this movie uh, and preparing for the Academy Awards in a couple of weeks. Uh, Beast of the Southern Wild is nominated for several awards, including uh, Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Actress. Um, and Q, my girl Q here, is uh, the youngest nominee, is that, that the, the youngest person ever to be nominated for an Academy Award, and that's a very big accomplishment.
But despite all of the national and international attention this, this, these folks are getting, they have taken the time to be here with all of you uh, to discuss this very important film today. Uh, they are all amazing people in their own right with amazing stories and hopefully they'll get a chance to share uh, some of their stories, but I know that Ben uh, developed this movie without a huge budget. budget. Uh, he, it, this is not a multi-billion dollar movie. He didn't have much. Um, so he had to be really creative and resourceful in order to get this movie uh, made. So hopefully he'll talk a little bit about how he got that done. And I don't know if you all know the story, or the world knows it, but Dwight uh, never acted a day in his life, never. <laughs> Not, not, not one, no plays, no pageants, no nothing. Uh, before he was cast for this movie, do you know what Dwight did? Uh, he ran a bakery across the street from where the movie was being filmed or where the auditions were taking place. Uh, so that's what he was doing before he did what you just saw. And he's also busy raising his five kids who I hope to one day uh, meet as well. So when they asked him to play the role of Wink, uh, he had to think long and hard about it because uh, he didn't have the experience, but in the end he decided to take the risk and now he's headed to the Oscars. I mean imagine, that's what happens in America when you're ready for stuff, right? And then Quivinjane, uh, as you know, was just five years old when she auditioned for the film, just five. Okay, imagine. Now, she seems like a grown woman sitting up here. And I, I understand she often acts like one. <laughs> but she was only five. So hopefully she'll tell you a little bit about how a five-year-old learns those lines and learns how to take on the role of that character and to bring that character to life, which is why she's been nominated for an Academy Award. It was very profound, amazing, and it doesn't happen often. So. Uh, I think that we can all agree that she did an extraordinary job, as did everyone involved in this film. So these folks uh, worked hard to make this incredible film, and I hope that you all take full advantage of this time today. Do you hear me, young people? Take full advantage of this time. Ask lots of questions. Don't be shy. I can't imagine that you all are shy, so don't act like it in here. It's because you're in the White House because we are all here today for you, and that's what I, we are here for you, okay? We did this for you. This event is important to me, not only because I love and believe in this film, but also because I deeply love and believe in all of you. Do you understand that? I deeply love and believe in all of you, and I haven't even met you, but I know you're out there, and I know your potential, I know your promise, and I wanna find every opportunity that I, that I can to continue to find ways, whatever ways we can, to inspire kids like you all over this country uh, to do amazing things. That's why we're doing this. This is for you, because the truth is that I know that I wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, and I know that my husband, President Obama, wouldn't be where he is today if he hadn't gotten that kind of inspiration from somebody in our lives. Um, we wouldn't be who we are today without all those people who pushed us and believed in us and, and gave us opportunities to learn and grow and, and fulfill our potential. We wouldn't be here. Like the characters in this movie, we know that our families and our communities gave us the love and support uh, to go out and pursue our, our dreams. Uh, but like Ben and Dwight and Quivinjane, uh, what I want you all to understand is that you have to do the work. All right, that's, that's my message. You have to do the work, okay? We're not here because we didn't do the work. We all did the work. Uh, you all have to really be focused on preparing yourselves for the challenges and the opportunities that will lie ahead for all of you. You gotta be prepared, so that means you have to go to school. Plain and simple, right now your job, as I tell Malia and Sasha, is go to school. No matter what is going on in your lives, uh, you have to go to school and you have to do your homework every day. Every day, that's all you have to do, that's your job. Um, you have to prepare your minds and your bodies for greatness, that's how you have to think about it. You're preparing yourself for greatness because if Dwight wasn't ready, it wouldn't have mattered 
what opportunity was waiting for him, if he wasn't ready to take it, it would have passed him by. So I want you all to understand that reading is important. You have to read everything you get your hands on. That's one of the things that President Obama does. He reads everything. He reads all the time. You have to read, read, and read again. And then I want you to think about everything you put in your body, the kind of foods you're eating, because if you're not eating healthy foods, you're not getting your mind or your heart ready uh, for the greatness that lies ahead. And every day, I want you all to imagine who you are going to be. All right, that's where it starts. You have to think of who you want to be in your head every single day. And think of all the images and the people that you see, whether it's me or Quivinjane or Ben or the president. Think about who you want to be. And dream big. Don't, don't aim low. Aim high. But then you have to get up every day and turn that dream into reality and work towards being who you envision yourself to be in your head. I still do that every day, every day. I'm thinking about who I want to be and what I have to do every day, what kind of person I have to be, how honest and truthful and hardworking I have to be to, to achieve that image, that big, bold image I have of myself in my head. That's how me, the President, Ben, Dwight, Quivinjane are doing what we're doing today. That's why we're up here. And we know, uh, absolutely know, and expect nothing less from all of you because we know you can be here too. That's our expectation. That's the trade-off of being here today, is that one day you'll be up here in some capacity doing some great thing. So work hard, uh, enjoy your time here today, and know that we love you all, OK? Know that. And I have to go, because they're going to have me do a bunch more work. <laughs> but enjoy the discussion. Rachel, I will turn things over to you so that you can continue to inspire these young people. Thank you all for being here. And thank you for all the teachers and staff and the folks who are working with these kids, the parents who are here today. Thank you for your work. Uh, and enjoy. Rachel? All right, well, let's get started. Uh, I have a million questions for these folks, and I'm sure you guys do too. I want to start with a very important question. Now, the First Lady rock this, but to prevent the rest of us, and most importantly, me, from embarrassment during this question and answer period, I would like to ask the young lady to my right to teach us how to pr correctly pronounce your name. Qua. Oh, so we all have to repeat. Try, start again. Qua. Qua. Vin. Ven. Je. Je. Ne. Say it all together. Quavengene. Yes. All right, that's probably the only correct time I will pronounce it. Quavengene. All right. <laughs> I might need to make copies. <laughs> so um, I wanted to start uh, with a question for you, Ben. Uh, watching this film, as a lot of the people, a lot of the uh, folks in this room and all the, the kids just did, uh, over in the uh, White House Theater, um, you're, you can't help but be struck by the amazing performances uh, in the film. So how many of the cast members were professional actors? Uh, zero. Um, no, no one who was in the film had ever acted before in their lives. Um, a couple people who had been in one of my short films, but, um, but there was nobody who, was, who had been through professional training or anything like that. We, um, you know, we did about four or five months of work together after the casting preparing for the roles that, where everybody really learned um, how to act and how to play these characters. So how did you go about casting for this film? Um, we, um, and some of the people right over here, Michael Gottwald, um, led this um, casting push where we were in schools, um, you know, in, in New Orleans and all through South Louisiana where we'd go into classes and ask kids to come out to audition. Um, we'd go to community centers, knock on doors, and just try to you know, get people out to, uh, to audition for the film. And uh, we looked at about 4,000 people trying to find uh, the role that Quavengene played. And uh, Dwight, uh, as you heard, was, was um, running the bakery across the street from where we were doing that. And so we got to know him there. And um, he came in for an audition one day. And, you know, we found people, a lot of the people in the film are friends. You know, we found people in a million different ways. But, um, you know, it was all people who we thought, um, 
just had inborn talent and had a sort of openness that was going to allow us to, to learn acting. Tell me more about that. What were you looking for? How did you, you know when you found one of your characters? Um, I mean, I think there's part, parts of it are looking for, for an actor. You're trying to, trying to find people who are, who are confident, that believe in themselves, that um, aren't self-conscious, that, um, and, that, and that, you know, that their personality somehow relates to the, what the film is, you know? And, and so, you know, we were really, really looking, the, the film is so much about people that are, you know, they're strong, they're fearless, um, they're resilient, um, you know, they're joyful, they're, you know, all those, those qualities. And not that you're trying to get people to play themselves, but you want people's, you, wanna, you want everybody who's in the film to really understand it and to understand the characters and what the film is about. And so um, I think those were the two main things that we would look for. And you, know, and you, just, you just meet people you know, uh, like Dwight and Quivengene who you just get along with. You know, I, think, I think that's a big thing too is because you're gonna spend you know, not only five months of rehearsal, a month of shooting, we've now been on the road together for over a year. You know, um, this becomes your, your family and so you, you take very seriously who you, who you let in and, and you want to find people who, you know, it's, make it, it's making a friend, you know, the same way that you, that you look at someone and say, are we going to get along? Um, that's really important too. So, Kwanjane, you have, had never done this before. You were five years old when you auditioned, is that correct? Yes. And then you were six when you started filming? Yes. So what was your favorite part about playing Hush Puppy? Um, she was a southern girl, and I am too. Um, and... <laughs> She loves seafood, like I do. Um, she loves animals and nature, and she just loves everything that just includes like, some, like a mystery or something that you can play with or something that you can be friends with and always sleep with them at night and hug them and stuff with that, like that. And what was your least favorite part about it? The mosquitoes. The mud, and that one scene whenever I had to touch that big, big hairy pig. <laughs> really, it was the pig that did it for you. I didn't like that pig. <laughs> <laughs> the only pig that I saw was a pink pig. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. Mm. All right, good to know. Um, and and Dwight, you you were a baker, yes. uh, and I guess my first question is: Are you still making donuts? Still making donuts. Okay, because they're My apparently is in a fantastic, and I, I I'm won't. never going to stop doing that. And so you're, you're sort of plucked from this life in which you're uh, a, a baker to, to have this amazing experience uh, that started with filming and ends with you going to the Oscars. Uh, probably not ends, but that's the next stop. So what, what has been the most surprising part of this whole experience for you? Well, the most surprising part is... Um, the, the greatest part is meeting all the different people, going around the country and getting a chance to meet all of these different people that I've admired for so many different years. Um, meeting Oprah Winfrey and meeting Miss Obama, and that's been the high point of all of the traveling I've been doing. Meeting all of the people that I've admired for so many years. So it, it clearly worked out well in hindsight, but you know, the, the First Lady talked about risk being prepared, taking a risk, and being prepared to take that risk. Did this feel like a risk for you, or did it feel like a, an Initi obvious Yeah, thing it did do? feel like a risk, because initially when they came at me to do the film, when they told me I, I had the part of the lead part, I initially I had to turn down the part because, um, you know, my, I've been in the bakery business, and I built the bakery for the past eight years before I did the film to be able to pass down to my children. And my children are the most important people in the world to me. And, you know, I worked so hard to build a business for them. And when they came along and had the opportunity for me to do the film, you know, it was a lot for me to think about. You know, I, I could have been selfish and say, I'm gonna go do the film for myself, but then I've been sacrificing my children's future. So I actually had to turn down the film and told them I couldn't do it because I couldn't sacrifice the business that I'm building to pass on my, to my kids for a possible movie career. See, my bakery is something that I know I'm gonna have. That's my foundation. 
a possible movie career is, is fine, but it's a possibility. I don't know what's gonna become of the movie business after the movie's over. So I have to have a good solid foundation to be able to uh, hold on to my bakery. So what allowed you to take that risk? What, what, what put you over the Well, they, the they, they believed in me. I, I actually thought back when I first opened up my bakery when nobody believed in me. I got turned down by every bank, every finance company, every friend, Every family member, they turned me down. No one believed that I can open up my bakery and be successful with no money. But no one believed in me but myself. If you believe in yourself, that's the first step in being successful is believing in yourself. And I believed in myself and I worked hard. I worked two jobs. Because nobody, no finance company didn't want to give me no money to buy $100,000 worth of equipment for my bakery. So I worked two jobs. I took care of my family with one check and another check. I bought one piece of equipment at a time. One piece at a time. It took me three years to open up, to build up, to get enough equipment, to buy a piece, put it in my grandmother's garage. Mm -hmm. Buy another piece next month, put it in my grandmother's garage. <laughs> Eventually, my grandmother's garage was so full, she said, get that stuff out of there. <laughs> I got it out there. I got, found me a storage unit. And after about three years, it took me. I looked in that storage unit. I had all my equipment. Then I said, I got to find me a building now. So looking all over the city to find me a building to open up this bakery that I wanted to open up. So the best, I thought about the best opportunity for me to be successful is to open up a business in my own neighborhood where I went to school at, where I grew up at. So I found the building in the neighborhood where I grew up at. And you know, the landlord, he gave me the opportunity to get in there. I mean, it's a long story, but to make a long story short, it took me three months to be successful in my business. I started making, being successful after three months opening it up and been open up for 13 years now successfully. And it's been a wonderful story, man. And it, just believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, there's nothing you can't do. Because if President Obama didn't believe that he can be president, he would not be here right now. So the first step is just believing in yourself. And it's funny, this is, this is almost word for word the exact story that Dwight told when he came into audition for the film. Is he told this story about opening up the bakery and that's what I saw and I, and I was so inspired by it and I knew you know, Dwight is, you know, the character I was trying to cast for, he's the same kind of guy. You know, he, he absolutely believes that he's gonna be able to survive in this town and he, and he believes in himself and his place and uh, you know, I just knew when I saw the way that Dwight told that story and what he'd managed to do coming from nowhere you know, um, and building something up by himself, I, I knew that he was gonna understand this character. And so it, the crazy thing is the same, the same story that started the bakery is what, what got Dwight into the film as well. So it just, it's just about um, yeah, that, that determination that he has. Well, talking about place, obviously place is a, is a character in your film. Uh, the bathtub is an incredibly fully realized, really um, uh, complicated, rich community. Uh, I'm struck in, in talking to you uh, about this film at how much community figured into uh, how you thought about this film, how you went about putting together this film, uh, and, and what you wanted to come out of this film. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the film was... Um the, the initial inspiration for the film was um, really about these towns all the way at the bottom of Louisiana. Um, you know, a lot of them pass the levees unprotected um, that are, you know, they're, they're, their land is falling off into the Gulf of Mexico, basically, and the trees are dying, and, and all the things you see happening in the film are happening down there. Um, and, you know, when I went down and started spending time down there, I, I, I was so struck by, you know, not only how, uh, how sort of fiercely people were holding on to the place and refusing to leave, you know, um, the, the floods keep on getting worse and worse and they just keep on building their houses higher and higher. You know, you have houses 15 feet in the air because um, people are holding onto their land. And, um, you know, and, but, and, and not just that, but, but um, also just how kind of joyful the culture still is. You know, it's so difficult to, to live down there, but people have managed to hold on to, um, you know, their spirit and just the, you know, the, the joy of life. And, 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 and that really, those two things were really what inspired me. And so, you know, in making the film, I wanted to show this type of community that, that just because they're because of their unity, because of how strongly they hold on to one another and, and their culture, um, it's impossible to break them. As, and and that, that's what happens in the film. And it sounds like that was also partially your experience in making the film. This large community that came together of locals and friends and 
uh, collaborators that really took a community to make this film. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that the, probably the reason I was drawn to it so much is because the experience of making the film, of making any film, is this huge collaboration. You know, we probably had 90 people that worked on this movie. Many of us have been friends since we were kids, and um, you know, you do feel like you're this sort of uh, brigade or something like that 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 has to stick together, or, or just the difficulty of making the film will will break it apart. And so, you know, the bathtub in, in many ways, you know, the community of the bathtub feels a lot like the community that uh, that, that made the film. I want to talk to you about a little bit more about your early childhood and the the, the band of folks you put together uh, from a long time ago to really to, to come together in this film. But I, I want to talk about the film a little bit first. We are fortunate to have two of the actors here. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the I'm the man scene. Uh, that is just obviously a, a huge uh, high point. Uh, <laughs> 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 Uh, in the film, and it's so rich and complex. Um, can you just tell me a little bit, maybe first you, Dwight, and then you, Quivange, about what was going on for you in that scene, and how you thought about it, and what it was like to shoot it? That particular scene right yeah. there? It was, a, it was one of my favorite scenes of the movie. It's just, it's just a, a, scene where, a, a scene where we actually showing our strength to each other, and father, daughter, showing our strength to each other. It's just a wonderful scene that, um, that I love to do. I love that scene. Did you have to gear up for it emotionally? Did it sort yeah, of? Yeah, because um, Ben did a good job, a good job on getting us prepped for the scenes and getting us emotionally ready for certain particular scenes. And um, you know, they brought in some people to actually work with us, some acting coaches to work with us on different emotions and things we had to learn. And um, yeah, it, it was a certain scenes was difficult, but that one wasn't that difficult because we was having so much fun doing it. So a lot of these scenes was not difficult as people, it may seem from people looking at it from the outside, because we was just having so much fun doing them. It was a lot of fun. Like Ben said, working with um, these guys, it's like working with your family, you know, all of them grew up together and we had, we laughed on set, we had so much fun on set, just like the second movie that I did. I don't want to mention it, but it's a more bigger budget, more professional, people don't know each other, and it was more, but at this first movie, Be Southern Southern Wild, I'll never forget it because of the family, the unity that they have with each other, and none of the, the scenes wasn't difficult. It was just so, we was having so much fun doing it. They didn't even have to pay me to do that. It was fun. <laughs> Did you hear that? I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't we'll tell pay, your we'll agent that. Everybody had a lot of fun doing it. It was a, a fun movie to do. And Kovanje? Um, that was a fun scene, like that scene. Um, it was something that I love because <laughs> me and my dad and my brothers who are out in the crowd over there and my mom, um, we usually just like play and play thumb war and just stuff that we're really like we just have fun all the time and it's just something that we do usually and it's just fun. So was that scene easy for you, too? Pretty much, yeah. What was the hardest scene to shoot for you? Aside from touching the pig. We've established that. Because I was about to say that one. Um, knife on it. Oh, my God. Got one. Um, the box. Whenever I ran and went under the box, um, that was a creepy scene because if you put core board in fire, it really burns very fast. So you were, you were in the box as the fire was going on outside? Yeah, kind of really. But it wasn't like close to me. It wasn't close to me, but it was hot with mosquitoes, and I was like... <sighs> I, think, I think we shone an orange light on you, and we were going... <sighs> <laughs> yeah, that was what was going on, but it was like hot. And so then you were putting yourself in the moment so much that you thought the fire. Yeah, was that's going. what I thought it was. It was like so creepy. And Ben, the the character that we obviously can't have on stage with us uh, here today, but played a huge um, part in the theme of the film, are the Oracs. Uh, there, I don't know how many of you noticed they actually made cookie Oracs cookies. Uh, which are outside uh, 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 to, to commemorate this event. Um, can you talk to me about what they, I'm going to get to what they actually were, but can you talk to me about what they were supposed to, what purpose they served in the film? Yeah, you know, um, 
I mean, they mean a lot of things, um, but I mean, I think where it started is the whole film was really supposed to be from the point of view of Hush Puppy and really put you in the head of um, what it's like to be six years old. And, you know, my memory of being six is, you know, I was living with a monster under the bed, there was a monster in the closet, you know, everywhere. I had, inv I had invisible friends that were walking around and, and I, I wanted the world of the film to really represent that. And I think for Hush Puppy, you know, the aurochs come out when um, right when her father gets sick, and and you know they relate to a lot of things, but it's it's she puts a lot of her fears into this creature that she learns about um, that that um, she learns this lesson about the cavemen fighting the aurochs and and the cave paintings, and so um, they sort of relate to that, um, but kind of you know they're really supposed to bring you into the to the world of what it's like to be six. And they were very scary in the film. What what were they really? How did you build an um, aurochs? In, in real life, the, the aurochs are actually baby Vietnamese pot belly pigs. Um, <laughs> they were about three weeks old. Um, They're about maybe about this long, about that high. Um, and what we did is we raised them from birth and we um, taught them how to wear costumes five minutes at a time, 10 minutes at a time. And then they were able to learn about six things, which were they were able to run, stop, sit down, turn around, and we taught them how to run on treadmills as well. Um, and, um, just to keep in shape? Well, no, just so we can, you know, pigs run real fast. So when their pigs are going, you, can, uh, you know, you have to move your camera extremely fast and it's hard to keep up with them. So if they're on a treadmill, it's easier to get a shot because they're <laughs> staying in one place. Um, but um, yeah, but it's all filmed, you know, I mean, I, I grew up making films, making animated films and building things at home. And, and it was very much filmed in, in, in that style where we just build miniature houses, you know, miniature sets. You know, we create miniature rain with a mister, um, and that makes these tiny little pigs look uh, really big. Once you add, you mean, when you actually hear them run, it's like this, but uh, you know, you add in sound effects, so every one of those steps sounds like Jurassic Park or something, and then that's what creates the illusion. Um, well, I want to turn it uh, uh, over to the audience, but I, I wanted, you were talking about what you did growing up. You know, you didn't come out of some Hollywood machine, you didn't have a development deal. Uh, you work with some of your closest friends from childhood, um, you know, we have a lot of artists and creative types out here. Some of them will be scientists and mathematicians, and some of them will be graphic designers or actors or filmmakers. Um, can you talk a little bit about your background and, and the kind of people you try and work with? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> I've been making stuff since I was a kid. I never knew that, that I wanted to make movies, but, um, you know, I remember, you know, I think when my sister was brought home from the hospital, my dad bought me a, a little puppet theater, and I would do puppet shows for her. And then you know we went from those puppet shows to filming them, and we would write stories and you know um, make up stories and act them out and stuff like that. And and really, you know, there isn't there wasn't really a moment where it became a career. It just we just kept on working together. And my sister works on the film. She she builds all the, she builds a lot of the sets with us. You know, all the producers I went to to school with, um, the guy who edited the movie I've known since I was one. Um, you know, and so we all just kind of kept on creating things together over time, and um, you know, um, yeah. I mean, I guess also, you know, I just say that you know we we've, we've been making movies since we were six, but it's not like they were good. They, they were all <laughs> really, really bad, and 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 uh, there's many films that I made that no one will ever ever see. Um, but um, you know, it just was it just was what we love to do. It's whenever you know we had an hour before dinner you know we go out and try to try to create something um just just for fun and, and and that really is what turned into into making movies and and this movie was made in in really that way we didn't have the money to buy fabricate sets or, or work in a studio so we would go out in the woods we'd you know find whatever rusty metal was laying around find our string find wood and no rusty metal finding yeah or get, you get guys. shots <laughs> uh but um but you know it was it was very much a homemade We'd, we'd build things by hand with whatever we had around, and, and that's the way that we did it when we were kids, and that's the way we're still doing it, so. Great, well I wanna turn it over to the audience, but actually my first, the first question I wanna pose to some folks in the audience, in addition to the people on stage with us here today, we're lucky to have Lucy Albar, the co-writer of the film, um, Quilendria Wallace, uh, Quavangene's mother, and her family members, and the three producers uh, that Ben was talking about who made the film. So I wanted to ask whether uh, any of you had anything you wanted to add to this before we turn it over to uh, the audience, um, see if any of the producers had something they wanted to add. Um, sure, I just wanted to say it's particularly cool to have um, kids from after school programs here because in fact the, the, the casting process was so um, 
long and comprehensive for this film that we, and we found so many kids that we liked a lot that we actually started our own after school program um, in New Orleans uh, with about 20 kids that we divided up into three classes and they each got to make their own um, short film. Um, or, we, or we worked with them to make a short film and then we had a premiere where they all got to watch their, their short films that they had helped create. Um, and so doing stuff like that is part, of, is, is part of why we all kind of got into movies, I think. You know, to make movies with the community around you and with your community of friends, with your community of classmates, and with your community of people that you're in an after-school program with. So, um, yeah, we're just very happy to be here and happy to be here with you guys. Yeah, Great. I actually was curious if anybody from New Orleans actually auditioned for this movie, because I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Maybe I do. Not. Oh, sorry, I do think we have another new. Dwight, didn't one of your sons actually go to Batiste Cultural Arts Academy, which is. Uh, all right, Batiste, raise your hand. Good job. All right, so I'd like to open it up to anybody in the audience. Um, we have somebody passing around a mic. If you could stand up and say your name and then ask your question, um, uh, I'm sure these guys would be excited to answer them. There's always a pause. Yes, ma'am, in the blue shirt in the front. Johnny, and I'm with Higher Achievement, and my question is for Quavin Janae. Yes. And it was, how did you prepare yourself emotionally for the really challenging scenes? Um, well, my brother Vinji helped me because he would aggravate me, but I still love you. <laughs> Vijan, on the other hand, he was aggravating, and he is lovely. I still love you. <laughs> and my mom, just a piece of everything. Um, and my father, everything. So. so it was really your family that helped you yeah, kind of fo much. stay focused and gear and up for sister, the scenes? And my sister, she's so sweet. I love her. Great. Another question? All right. Uh, you young lady over here in the front. Okay. Okay. Um, my name's Amelia, and I'm I go to Johnson, and I have a question for Kwan. I can't. Say oh, that. I know what you're saying. I'm gonna call you Q. <laughs> okay. So I have a question for you. Um, so like when you like was crying in the scene, like were you really crying? Were those real tears? Yes. <laughs> and would you do another movie? Um, I did Twelve Years a Slave, and I did a charity movie, and I did a movie called Bone Shaker. Is that since Beast of the Southern Wild? Yes, that was after. Um, another question? Come on, you know you've got them. Come on, I know y'all got some questions. Come on. Come on, Mrs. Chai Mac. Wants. All dressed in black, black, black. Oh, I'm probably loud enough, but. Um, I was wondering, I heard that you started filming right around the time of the BP oil disaster. Did that have any impact on like the emotion in the film and what you were trying to portray? Yeah, the um, Deepwater Horizon actually exploded on the same day we started shooting. Um, and the town we were filming in is probably the closest land location. Uh, we were in um, Point of Chien, Louisiana, um, Montague, Point of Chien, Ile de Jean Charles. Um, that's right close to where, where that was happening. and. Um, you know, I mean, and a, a lot of people in the community were working on the film, um, and um, you know, it was a very scary period because there was a real threat that they were going to close fishing in the town for ten years, and that literally would be the end of Point Chen, Louisiana. Um, you know, the so I, I remember, and it was it was while we were shooting some of the scenes that were about the fish dying and about the environment dying, um, feeling like that was actually happening, and like maybe. The, maybe the, the shots we were getting of this place were going to be the last record of this place existing. And so um, it, it was a very palpable emotion. You know, I think it just fed into, into what we were doing. It, it suddenly felt um, even more real than it already was. Um, you know, and there was that on top of actually just, you know, a lot of the film is shot offshore um, and the oil was, the oil, the oil came past some of our locations. And so um, the, these guys, the producers, had to actually negotiate with BP to get our boats into the, the locations where we were, fil we were filming the movie. So it was a, uh, it definitely took over, um, you know, it, it took over the shoot in, in, in many ways. 
Other questions? Yes, young man. I'm Algernon. You say you went from being a baker to the um, movie. Was it hard and emotional for you? Were you stressed? Um, it was a difficult. It was very difficult because it was hard because uh, uh, my loyalty was with my bakery and that I built for my kids. But you know, the the film was something that I wanted to do because um, you know, the guys from Court Thirteen they seen some things in me that I didn't see in myself, and they believed in me. And you know, I thought back to the time when nobody believed in me, and I had these guys come all the way from New York. First time feature filmmakers, and they believed in me. They seen some things that I didn't see in myself, and um, you know, I was glad that I gave them the opportunity to pull these things out of me that I didn't see in myself. Because sometimes people see things in us that we don't see in ourselves. And so, you know, I, I was glad that I gave them the opportunity to pull these great things out of me that I didn't see in myself. We actually did a lot of our work on the, on the character in the bakery, too, because one way, one way that Dwight was able to do the film was that he was able to keep the bakery open. You know, that was important, that the bakery wasn't going to close down, and so we had all this rehearsal to do, four months of rehearsal, and what we would do is we would, I would show up um, when he starts baking around 11 o'clock midnight, and while he was rolling dough and making donuts, you know, we would be going through the lines, we'd be doing interviews, uh, you know, trying to develop this character, and so... By, by doing that, um, we were able to, we, we knew that when we cast Dwight, that we were also casting the bakery and that both things had to, had to stay alive. And so, you know, that, that was an important thing was that we were able to make that work. Did you gain a lot of weight during those rehearsals? <laughs> <laughs> they ate a lot of buttermilk drops. They ate a lot of buttermilk drops, yeah. They were really good. Other questions? Yes, uh, in the back. Hi, I'm Forrest from Sitar Art Center. Um, I want to say that was amazing. It was the first time I saw it. Anyways, uh, so my question is, since the film didn't start off as this big budget Hollywood film and started very kind of small, um, how did it become from this, what it was to this big success and what was the payoff for everybody? Um, well, you know what, I mean the way, the way that it works is basically you, um, we premiered our film at Sundance Film Festival, which is a which is a festival for independent films, you know, um, there's a lot of very small movies there, and basically what happened was, you know, we finished the film two days before that. Uh, our whole cast came out. People drove from New Orleans. They were in the theater, um, and then we showed it for the first time, and we had this huge response. We got a standing ovation. Um, you know, we started getting calls from distribution companies who are who buys a film and then puts it in movie theaters. And so um, Fox Searchlight bought the film um, and released it. And, and you know, it really, grow, it really grew because people told their friends about it. You know, it was re released very small. One person tells another to go see it. And, and because of that, you know, um, it, it's all over the world. And we've literally been, I, I think we've been to 20 countries it's, it's being released all over the planet, and, and that all just happens because people watched it and they wanted other people to watch it. Um, because, you know, even, even, even though the film was bought and released, you know, most films that go far have famous actors in them or, you know, some sort of famous person associated with it in some way. And, and this was really just um, the same way the movie was made with just, you know, people, you know, a grassroots community that there's really been a, a community that's formed around. <laughs> getting this film out into the world, and, and now, you know, our community includes the White House. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty wild, but, it, but it's really just that, that's how it happens. Okay, I think we just have time for maybe one or two more questions. Oh, and now all your hands go up. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with the kids um, in the middle in the purple beads. My name is Alyric. Uh, you said, you had like your sights focused on um, baking, and after the movie, do you think um, you want to continue acting? Yeah, I actually did another film I did after *Beast of the Southern, Southern Wild*, um, but I have a lot. I have a, so much, so many different things going on. I have another bakery that I'm actually opening up in Harlem uh, this spring, and I have so much going on right now. So it's it's just unbelievable. If something else, I'm just actually riding a wave right now because um, I have so many different things, wonderful things going on right now to where 
I'm really trying to put a team of people together to be able to do everything, to be able to do fumes again if they come along, and to be able to keep my bakeries open, expand my bakery business at the same time. So I'm trying to build me a team of people together, a group of people, just like Core 13, to be able, where I can be able to do all of these wonderful things. Uh, uh, all right, in the back, in the green shirt. Okay. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm with Sitar Art Center. And like around the beginning of the movie, um, you slapped her, right? And like, tough and love. then like, it's called it, tough love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that surprised me because like, because like I actually like thought it looked like so real. Like if you actually did slap her, like how? She burnt the house down. I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you burn your house down, why should your mom, your dad do this? <laughs> So uh, but, but no, were the, you... just to answer the question, uh, it wasn't it wasn't a real slap. That's sort of part one of my question. My other part is like, how did you like make it look so real that like? <laughs> Maybe I should answer this one. Yeah. Um, ba basically, uh, it's 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 sound effects and where you put the camera. You know, uh, so. Uh, you know, if you were to watch, if you were to watch it from here, you know, you would see. I would just go like this. He would turn his head at the right time, and it wouldn't look good. But if you put the camera over here, as my hands going by his face, he's turning his head, and then we add in a sound effect that makes it sound sound like he hit her, and then uh, never touched her. Yeah, but never he was even touched. He was far away. We had a problem because because uh, it was so funny that uh, every every time she would get slapped, as as her face was going by, you'd just see the smile opening up on her face. <laughs> And so it took a while to get to get serious and, and really make our, make ourselves feel like it was happening, even though um, it, it's an illusion. All right, two more questions. I think uh, yes, there was one over here, young lady, in the black sweatshirt. This question is for Q. Okay. Um, how did you um, balance school and your acting career? Um, when we were shooting, I actually had like a tutorer, and she would go there and just like teach me and why I'm here. I'm on my break, yay. Um, while I'm here, the teachers send me work and I just do my work that way. All right, great. Last question, uh, you in the front. If you said that the, the pigs were only babies, how did they look so big? compared to Quinanjane when she was just standing there. Sure, yeah. The so m most of the most of the effects are all done with miniatures, but that one's a little bit different. Um, for the for the last scene of the movie, we take the pigs and we film them on a on a green screen. And then you basically when you do it on a green screen, you can cut out what's in the green screen and you can blow it up to any size you want. And so um, you know, when she was acting, she's actually looking at somebody holding a cardboard cutout. Uh, of of an Orox, which was that was Corey. Corey was holding the, the the cardboard, and so then in, when we go into the computers afterwards, we erase Corey with the cardboard cut out, and we put in a giant uh, a giant pig. But um, yeah, even those pigs are tiny little babies. So before we go, I want to ask uh, the folks up here. Um, we have an amazing group of people here with us in the White House today. Um, uh, people who go on and kids will go on and do all kinds of amazing things and parents and educators uh, and, and, and government folks and principals. So what, uh, what is one message that you would want to leave them with as your final thought for the day? Um, keep your head up, never let it down. Um, believe in God, he's always there, always by your side. He's never going to leave. Um, just keep believing in your parents, and parents keep the phones on because you never know. Something might call, hit the bell, and you just want to go to the audition. So just keep the phones on. Dwight? Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself when nobody else in the world believe in you. Just as long as you believe in yourself, anything can, anything can happen. Um, yeah, and I, I just say, you know, um, 
stick with your friends, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I was I was y'all's age uh, when I met a lot of the people that I've worked with my entire life, and um, you know, um, yeah, making do, doing what you want a lot of times is just is just doing things with the people that you love, and and uh, you know, so um, you know, work hard and and stick with your friends, and and uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, you know, it's it's a great life being able to be uh, creative, you know, and so you know, when I was a kid, it was always just. Um, try to use my imagination as much as possible. And, um, you know, just when I had free time, just um, make what I wanted to make. And, you know, it's, it's turned into uh, to something really gigantic. So it's a great thing. Well, thank you guys so much for being with us here. And thank you all for coming. And uh, I believe there are Orax cookies out there in the foyer. Um, and thank you all very much. Thank you.